Duke Ellington by Andrea Davis Pinckney. You ever hear of the jazz playing man, the man with the cats who could swing with his band? He was born in 1899 in Washington, D.C., born Edward Kennedy Ellington. But wherever young Edward went, he said, hey, call me Duke. Duke's name fit him rightly. He was a smooth talking, slick stepping piano playing kid. But his piano playing wasn't always as breezy as his stride. When Duke's mother, Daisy, and his father, J.E., enrolled him in piano lessons, Duke didn't want to go. Baseball was Duke's idea of fun. But his parents had other notions for their child. Duke had to start with the piano basics, his fingers playing the same tired tune. One and two and one and two. Daisy and J.E. made Duke practice day after day. To Duke, one and two wasn't music. He called it an umpy dump sound that was headed nowhere worth following. He quit his lessons and kissed the piano a fast goodbye. Years later, on a steamy summer night, Duke heard that umpy dump played in a whole new way. Folks called the music ragtime, piano that turned umpy dump into a soul rousing romp. The ragtime music set Duke's fingers to wiggling. Soon he was back at the piano, trying to plunk out his own ragtime rhythm. One and two and one and two. At first, this was the only crude tinkling Duke knew. But with practice, all Duke's fingers rode the piano keys. Duke started to play his own made-up melodies. Whole notes, chords, sharps, and flats, left-handed hops, and right-handed slides. Believe it, man, Duke taught himself to press on the pearlies like nobody else could. His one and two umpy dump became a thing of the past. Now, playing the piano was Duke's all-time love. When he was 19, Duke was entertaining ladies and gents at parties, pool halls, country clubs, and cabarets. He had fine as pie good looks and flashy threads. He was a ladies' man with flair to spare. And whenever a pretty skinned beauty leaned on Duke's piano, he played his best music, compositions smoother than a hairdo sleeked with pomade. It wasn't long before Duke formed his own small band, a group of musicians who played all over Washington, D.C. But soon they split the D.C. scene and made tracks for New York City, for Harlem, the place where jazz music ruled. They called themselves the Washingtonians and performed in all kinds of New York City honky-tonks, Barron's Exclusive, The Plantation, Ciro's, and The Kentucky Club. Folks got to know the band by name and came to hear them play. Then, on an autumn day in 1927, Lady Luck smiled pretty on the Washingtonians. They were asked to play at the Cotton Club, Harlem's swankiest hangout, a big-time night spot. The Cotton Club became a regular gig for Duke and his band. They grew to 12 musicians and changed their name to Duke Ellington and his orchestra. Night after night, they played their music, which was broadcast live over the radio. For all those homebodies out in radio lover's land, folks who only dreamed of sitting pretty at the Cotton Club, the show helped them feel like they were out on the town. Duke's Creole love call was spicier than a pot of jambalaya. His mood indigo was a musical stream that swelled over the airwaves. Sometimes the orchestra performed their tunes straight up, but other nights when the joints started to jump, Duke told his band to play whatever came to mind, to improvise their solos, to make the music fly. And they did. Each instrument raised its own voice. One by one, each cat took the floor and wiped it clean with his own special way of playing. 
Sonny Greer pounded out the bang of jump rope feet on the street with his snare drum. A subway beat on his bass drum, a sassy ride on his cymbal. Sonny's percussion was smooth and steady. Sometimes only his drumsticks made the music, cracking out the rattly beat of wood slapping wood. Along with Sonny, Joe Tricky Sam Nanton went to work on his trombone, sliding smooth, melodic gold. He stretched the notes to their full tilt, pushing and pulling their tropical lilt. When Tricky Sam was through, he'd nod to Otto Toby Hardwick. Your turn, he'd say. Take the floor, Daddy-o. Toby let loose on his sleek brass saxophone, curling his notes like a kite tail in the wind, a musical loop-de-loop with a serious twist. Last came James Bubber Miley, a one-of-a-kind horn player. He could make his trumpet wail like a man whose blues were deeper than the deep blue sea. To stir up the sound of his low moan horn, Bubber turned out a growl from way down in his throat. His gut bucket tunes put a spell on the room. Yeah, those solos were kicking. Hot buttered bop with lots of sassy cool tones. When the band did their thing, the Cotton Club performers danced the Black Bottom, the Fishtail, and the Susie Q. And while they were cutting the rug, Duke slid his honey-colored fingertips across the ivory 88s. The word on Duke and his band spread from New York to Macon to Kalamazoo and on to the sunshiny Hollywood Hills. The whole country soon swung to Duke's beat. Once folk got a taste of Duke's soul-sweet music, they hurried to the record stores asking, Yo, you got the Duke? Slide me some King of the Keys, please. Gonna play me that piano prince in his band. People bought Duke's records. Thousands of them. In 1939, Duke hired Billy Strayhorn, a musician who wrote songs. Billy became Duke's ace, his main man. Duke and Billy worked as a team. Together they composed unforgettable music. Billy's song, Take the A Train, was one of the greatest hits of 1941. With the tunes that he and Billy wrote, Duke painted colors with his band's sound. He could swirl the butterscotch tones of Tricky Sam's horn with the silver notes of the alto saxophones. And oh, those clarinets. Duke could blend their red-hot blips with a purple dash of brass from the trumpet section. In time, folks said Duke Ellington's real instrument wasn't his piano at all. It was his orchestra. Most people called his music jazz, but Duke called it the music of my people. And to celebrate the history of African-American people, Duke composed a special suite he called Black, Brown, and Beige, a suite that rocked the bosom and lifted the soul. Black, brown, and beige sang the glories of dark skin, the pride of African heritage, and the triumphs of black people from the days of slavery to the years of civil rights struggle. Duke introduced black, brown, and beige at New York's Carnegie Hall, a symphony hall so grand that even the seats wore velvet. Few African Americans had played at Carnegie Hall before. Duke and his orchestra performed on January 23rd, 1943. Outside, the winter wind was cold and slapping, but inside, Carnegie Hall was sizzling with applause. Duke had become a master maestro. Because of Duke's genius, his orchestra now had a musical mix like no other. And now you've heard of the jazz playing man, the man with the cats who could swing with his band, King of the Keys, Piano Prince, Edward Kennedy Ellington, The Duke.